Welcome to the law faculty at the University of New South Wales for this important Q&A on the asylum debate. As you'll know, this issue of refugees and asylum and protection has, in its most intense phase, been running for nearly two decades. It's an issue that spanned the prime ministerships of Paul Keating, John Howard, Kevin Rudd and now Julia Gillard. In Australia, we've had a whole national election, the 2001 Tampa election, seemingly devoted to this issue. And of course, we've seen these echoes re-emerge in the 2010 election, where it seems that this issue just won't go away. Australia's even invented a whole new lexicon for dealing with this issue. We've uh, now got illegal refugees. We've got queue jumpers, offshore and onshore processing, and a range of other terms that simply didn't exist in our dictionaries two decades ago. We've also had a range of novel laws in Australia that, that really perhaps make us stand out in the Western world. We've had laws that have not only excised parts of the nation, but have also seemingly made it almost impossible to get judicial review of asylum seeker claims. But central to all of this, and what has really underpinned this whole debate for two decades, is of course the, the presence and role of international law. We are of course talking about the entitlements that people have under international law as applied by Australia. And what we're doing tonight is having four very eminent experts in conversation around these issues. We've got a series of questions going to the heart of our obligations as a nation under international law in this area. Questions such as what are the extent of those obligations relating to matters whether it be climate change or other contemporary problems. We've also got, uh, with our overseas experts, the opportunity to ask questions such as just how different are we? Um, is Australia unique in the way that we approach these questions? Or perhaps do we actually have something that we can teach other countries about how to approach the asylum debate? In the uh, format tonight, uh, we've got some questions. I've got a series of questions to go through and I'll also take some questions from the audience. And then at about 7.45, I'll have a short book launch uh, for the last 15 minutes and then we will finish at 8 p.m. Uh, I know that people won't want to go beyond then. Our speakers tonight for our Q&A panel, we, we tried very hard, but unfortunately Barnaby Joyce and Mark Abib were not available <laughs> for this panel uh, for unexplained reasons. But unfor or fortunately, I should say, we have managed to secure nonetheless a formidable panel of international experts. Uh, UNSW is very fortunate to have a, a, a virtual who's who of international asylum or refugee law before us tonight. And I don't think you could ask for any better event anywhere in the world this year in terms of the experts on this topic coming to answer and talk about these key issues. We've got three visitors to Australia and to the UNSW Law Faculty and to the new Refugee Law and Policy Group and our own Very Jane McAdam as well on the panel. The four are also currently working together on a number of projects, including a collaborative research project on war crimes and refugee status. And my hope tonight is that not only do we get the agreement that we can expect, that perhaps we can explore some areas of disagreement between the four of them and to see where some of the controversies and other principal differences might lie. Our first panellist is Professor Guy Goodwin-Gill, who is a Senior Research Fellow at All Souls College, Oxford, and a Professor of International Refugee Law at the University of Oxford. He served as a legal advisor in the Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, UNHCR, for 12 years in various countries, including Australia. He's the founding editor of the International Journal of Refugee Law and has written very extensively on refugees, migration, elections, and child soldiers. And to use the technical term that we use in academia, he has published more books than you can poke a stick at. Uh, he also practices as barrister from Blackstone Chambers in London. Professor Jeff Gilbert, on my right, is a professor of law in the School of Law at the Human Rights Centre at the University of Essex. He took over from Guy as the editor-in-chief of the International Journal of Refugee Law. He's been a specialist advisor at the Joint Parliamentary Committee on Human Rights in the UK in its inquiry into the treatment of asylum seekers. He's carried out human rights training on behalf of the Council of Europe and UNHCR and the Russian Federation and a number of other countries. <laughs> Professor Jane, sorry, Professor Kate Jastrom on my left uh, is from the United States, the Berkeley Law Faculty, which she joined in 2002. She's previously been a legal advisor to UNHCR and has served as an expert on asylum issues for the US Commission on International Religious Freedom. Her own scholarly work explores many areas relevant to this debate, 
including the challenges that states face in balancing protection for forced migrants with their national security concerns. And finally, to the far right from the University of New South Wales, Associate Professor Jane McAdam, who is the Director of Research in the UNSW Faculty of Law and the Director of the International Refugee and Migration Law Project at the Gilbert and Tobin Centre of Public Law, and she helped create the faculty's Refugee Law and Policy Group. Uh, she's also a research associate in the Refugee Studies Centre at the University of Oxford, and her own work deals with a range of similar areas to our other panellists, and in particular recently dealing with the challenges posed by climate change for the creation of refugees and for the question of people movement. Now I've got a number of questions to explore the issues that this formidable panel brings in terms of their expertise, but we also have a roving mic here today, and we've got Rowena in the centre. Um, I recognise that uh, we have a really wonderful audience here tonight and there'll be questions that you'd like to put to our experts. So what I will, will do at different points is to stop and check if you've got questions you'd like to put. In doing so, can you please identify who you are and identify who you would like to answer your question? And I'll try and get as many questions to the floor as well. We've got about an hour or more before the book launch, so I'll kick it off. Um, what I'd be interested in initially from our panel, and uh, I'd like to hear briefly from each of the panellists on this, as to what they see as being the most central, most difficult challenge facing us in the area today when it comes to people movement and the ability of the law to cope with that challenge. What do they see as the big question before us today? Yeah, Kate, perhaps if we could start with you. Thank you, George, um, and thank everyone for coming out tonight. This is a great turnout. Um, I would say that the greatest single challenge would be the unwillingness or inability of governments to distinguish between forced migrants and people who are moving in a somewhat more voluntary manner. And I realize that is a spectrum, but there is a, a conflation of asylum seekers with you know, terrorists, with economic migrants, with all kinds of other categories of persons, and it's not correct and it's not helpful and it doesn't really lead to good policy uh, choices. Guy? Thank you. I, I very much agree with that. Um, we have a problem, I think, for the, the international rule of law, which is driven by the reluctance, continual reluctance of states to recognize that the, they have obligations in this area, obligations which they have helped themselves to develop and to which they have voluntarily committed themselves and their communities. We also have a related problem, which I think states have to deal with in one way or another, which is the deliberate misrepresentation of the asylum issue, which we find replicated so often in the media, particularly the less worthy elements of the media. Thank you. Jeff or Jan? Um, if you could just speak with the mic too, thank okay. you. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for inviting me. And it, it's difficult to think of anything else to add, but I suppose one of the things that springs to my mind coming from um, Europe is just how much refugee law is now being limited by the states of the, the industrialized states and how they're drawing on each other's experience and expertise in keeping people out so much so that you see concepts first um, used either in the US or in Australia being taken up in Europe and this idea that there should be a practice almost amongst industrialized states of keeping people out that this is the objective now as opposed to what was originally thought of in the early 1950s, which was that we were there to offer protection. And I think I'd add to that that a challenge uh, for states, but certainly also for NGOs and scholars who <coughs> might like to see categories of protection expanding, is how to do that, in a, or how to advocate for that, in a climate where we do have governments um, cracking down all the time on trying to limit people movement. So whether we're talking about expanding economic categories of migration or additional protection categories, uh, George alluded earlier to the, the relationship between climate change and displacement. Uh, I, think, I think that we have to be aware of the, the pragmatic um, elements at play which may well pose difficulties in trying to um, find a, you know, a, a kind of um, palatable argument as to why these other groups of people might need assistance. Look, my next question is to Guy, and uh, Guy, as someone who 
looks at Australia from the outside. I wonder if you could explain to us how you see Australia's international obligations with respect to asylum seekers and refugees, and uh, what, what essentially do you think Australia is required to do? And as part of that, uh, perhaps you could indicate whether you think we're living up to that obligation. I start very much from my own experience here in Australia back in the late 70s, early 80s, which was, I think, a great period for refugee resettlement and recognition of the obligations which go with having subscribed to the basic international treaties on refugees, a role which Australia had uh, played rather quietly up till then, but which reflected its deep-seated commitment to the issues back in the 1940s and 1950s when it participated in the drafting. It had, through its own ratification of the 51 Convention in 1954, helped to bring that 51 Convention into force. But it wasn't until later that asylum seekers, as we understand the phenomenon today, began to arrive in Australia. But that was the point at which Australia bit the bullet. It said, right, here is the Convention, here is the definition of a refugee, we better look at everyone arriving in boats on the northern shore and to see whether they are refugees. And so they established the Determination of Refugee Status Committee. But at the same time, and most significantly, they recognized their role internationally and committed this country to play an important, uh, make an important contribution to the resolution of the Indochina refugee problem and to help those other countries in the region, in Southeast Asia and South, around the South China Sea, to continue to admit refugees from, uh, in particular, the three countries of Indochina. And it played a major role in that international effort. And it's that which seems to have been forgotten, it seems to me. Uh, Australia, not alone in this matter, Australia has very often chosen latterly to pursue a unilateral path towards refugee issues and the refugee and asylum seeker issues, whereas it ought, if it reflected little on its own recent experience, so to have recognized that these issues can only be addressed through a cooperative approach, one which brings in other states, which recognizes the interests of other states, and which commits itself through that process to the protection of the rights of those in search of refuge. So when you ask me to reflect on Australia's commitments, they are no different from, amongst others, the 147 states, which are also party to the refugee regime. They are no different to the other many uh, states that have ratified the various human rights treaties. It, there is, though, unfortunately, a gap very much between the obligations which have been voluntarily accept, accepted and their implementation in policy and practice. Thank you. In your answer, Guy, you obviously alluded to the fact that the Refugee Convention remains absolutely central to this area, and, and I had a question for Kate, but to what extent is it fair to say that that convention is still doing the job that it's meant to do? Is it still relevant? Is it sufficiently up to date to meet the legal and other challenges that are facing us in this area? Well, the Refugee Convention has anchored a really remarkable international regime that has protected millions of people since the end of the Second World War. Uh, we continue as Professor Goodwin Gill indicated there's 147 states parties. That's a really high level of adherence. States continue to sign on to the Refugee Convention and Protocol, so it's not just a, a World War II era artifact. Uh, it's now established law that persons fleeing from persecution or torture can't be forcibly returned to their home countries. And that's a huge shift in international law in a relatively short time that this is, this is now an accepted rule. Uh, the refugee definition itself has not changed since it was drafted right after the Second World War, but it's proven sufficiently flexible. So, for example, the Refugee Convention doesn't reference women or gender, and yet it's been possible to creatively and progressively interpret the refugee definition so that gender-based claims and claims based on sexual orientation, for example, are able to be recognized. Uh, and I should say Australian jurisprudence has played an important role in that. So, I would certainly submit that the Refugee Convention uh, doesn't need to be amended and has proven its ability to keep up with the times. Well, based upon that, I might actually put a related question to Jane. I mean, Jane, a lot of your work is dealing with climate change and the difficulties posed in that area. Uh, do you think that the Refugee Convention is what is required to deal with that problem? Is it going to be adequate to deal with what could be a mass migration of people? No, I don't think the Refugee Convention is uh, appropriate, but uh, neither in terms of what the current definition provides, but also I would query whether it's the appropriate kind of instrument to address the sort of movement that is likely to um, occur because of climate change. Now, if that statement in itself is somewhat loaded because um, there is 
a lot of, I mean, the, the issue of um, climate change and the degree to which it can actually cause movement is very contested in the scholarship and by the empirical evidence that we have. So climate change is certainly a factor that may form part of somebody's decision to leave um, their home, but the underlying socioeconomic conditions will uh, play a very important role in that decision. So for example, um, if you compare the Netherlands um, with Bangladesh, similarly low-lying countries, people in the Netherlands are not going to find themselves by and large in the same predicament as people in Bangladesh. Um, a related point is that much of the movement is likely to be internal. The Refugee Convention only applies to people who cross an international border. Now that's not to say that, um, that there's no need to sit back and, and uh, not address the issue of cross-border movement where environmental reasons or climate change plays a role, but I would um, query both on a conceptual level and a pragmatic level um, the utility of trying to expand the Refugee Convention framework or alternatively try to come up with a, a separate instrument simply regulating climate-related movement. So what is the answer then? Well, <laughs> um, I mean, one of the things that I think is very important here is that in the, the field work that I've done and that other people have done in countries like uh, Kiribati, Tuvalu, the so-called sinking island states, or in Bangladesh, India as well, people very strongly reject the refugee label. They don't want to be associated with people who uh, they perceive as languishing in camps for many years, uh, not having durable solutions forthcoming. Um, and there's a question of dignity there as well, people feeling that they uh, are failing in their responsibilities to their family if they are somehow forced to, to be in this situation. So I think based on what people themselves ha are asking for, um, certainly in the Pacific region, is migration with dignity. So in other words, trying to develop um, circular or temporary, um, which in due course may become permanent migration options that allow people to plan for their movement, that allow people to move backwards and forwards between the new country and the old country, to bring family members um, with them when, when those family members wish to, to relocate. Uh, and there may be a need for some residual humanitarian response at some point in the event of a, a sudden disaster, for example. But I think we do really need to look into these broader migration options. Look, I might ask at this point, is there anyone else on the panel who wants to make a contribution on this question we've been talking about of climate change? Uh, Jeff? The thing about climate change is it, it covers a whole range of different experiences. I mean, you've got the general movement of people as the, cli as the climate of the planet does seem to be changing with desertification in certain parts of the world. But that movement has been going on for ages. There has always been movement related to climate change. What you've got to contrast that with is something like the tsunami that we saw um, earlier in the decade, where that caused a mass movement of people for a specific time, or earthquakes that aren't anything to do with climate at all. But again, you get this sudden movement of people that need to be protected. Should the refugee regime be, uh, be the one used in those circumstances, well, what you've got there is possibly a confusion between the 1951 convention and, to, and the role of UNHCR, as though the two go together and are synonymous. UNHCR is the organisation within the United Nations that has the most experience of dealing with displacement. Therefore, at times, it has stepped in um, and dealt with the movement of people resulting not just from persecution, uh, but also as a result of significant climate-related events or other natural disasters. Just because UNHCR has done that doesn't mean it suddenly becomes a refugee issue and whether the UN needs a separate organisation to be dealing with that sort of event, what, how it should approach the more general movement relating from um, climate change over a long period, those are issues which I think have not been properly addressed uh, by either scholars, the United Nations or by states in general. Uh, Kate or, or Guy, uh, 
Jeff's just talked a bit about the role of UNHCR, and uh, that's, that organisation has loomed very large in Australian debates about asylum seekers, and particularly when it comes to offshore processing, where the oversight of the UNHCR has been seen politically as a very important thing in justifying the appropriateness of the processes that have been put in place. I wonder from your perspective if you could say a little bit about what the role of that organisation is and I mean, is it an acceptable thing for Australia in dealing with offshore settlement to say because we've got an organisation like that involved that that means that our concerns are allayed about that policy? Um, I hesitate to say it's unacceptable. Uh, UNHCR's role is uh, a limited one, not least because there's limited resources and lots of refugees in the world. Its role is really to supervise states in their protection of refugees. You know, UNHCR doesn't protect refugees. States have to protect refugees. So UNHCR plays a sort of a watching brief, a monitoring brief. It's not an appropriate use of UNHCR's resources to, for example, carry out to make the asylum decisions in a country like Australia, because Australia has the wherewithal to do it for itself. Um, if I can just reflect back on some of my experiences with UNHCR in another contested situation um, with my own government, uh, the, before the US government kept illegal combatants on Guantanamo, they kept asylum seekers on Guantanamo. And it was a very difficult situation for UNHCR, which wanted to be there so that it could do some good, and yet, of course, it, it played into the stance of the U.S. government that everything there was fine because UNHCR was there. So uh, we don't need to cry for UNHCR here, but it's, you know, they are trying to balance many things as well, and it, it's not easy for the organization when the governments are somewhat cynically playing that UNHCR card. Let me, if I may, just add a few words to that. I think um, I mean, UNHCR, as, as Professor Jashan has pointed out, has a very important supervisory role. And as, as we know also, it has been able, um, through the gathering of precedent and the watching of state practice, to contribute in an important way to the progressive development of, of refugee law. Um, but there's also some concern, has been for some time amongst refugee advocates in particular, that the office might overextend itself by getting into the sort of work which could end up diluting the refugee concept. And some states, I think, would be quite happy with that. And there was certainly a movement in the 90s to move the refugee phenomenon more into the humanitarian assistance category and away from a rights-based protection category. I think that's a danger that UNHCR is certainly aware of, uh, even if it hasn't always responded as most effectively as it might. There's a very special point, though, about UNHCR, which reflects, again, its capacities or its, its, its potentialities. Uh, which necessarily vary over time uh, insofar as they find themselves realized or not realized. And that is it stands as a, very much as a pivot in an international regime which is oriented around refugee protection and refugee solutions and in which the 51 Convention and the 67 Protocol play their part. And that is an interesting position for UNHCR to be in for various reasons, one of the most important of which is the autonomy which in principle the High Commissioner enjoys in virtue of the fact that he or she is elected by the UN General Assembly, not appointed by the Secretary General. Now that doesn't mean that political issues don't come in, that political interests are not factored into that election process. They are. But nonetheless, the fact that the High Commissioner reports not to the Secretary General but to the General Assembly gives him or her potentially quite a measure of autonomy and capacity to influence the way in which states develop their policies, something which I think successive high commissioners have to learn usually uh, anew. Thank you. You know, hopefully uh, you've sort of been warmed up through a few questions, and uh, I'd like to give you the opportunity now, if there's anyone in the audience, I'll take a couple of questions from the audience before going back to some questions myself. I just wanted to ask yesterday's events at Villawood, which were, um, you know, um, interesting and grabbed a lot of media attention. I wanted to ask if any of the speakers feel like those events impacted on the asylum debate at all, and if so, in what way? Um, yeah. And by the events at Villawood, you're talking about the, the suicide of a Fijian man there? Uh, and the protest as well, yeah. And the protest. Well, perhaps, Jane, we might start, and, and if anyone else wants to add anything, you're welcome to. Thank you, Rosemary, for your question. Um, I think the events that we've seen unfolding in the last day are, are tragic and they remind us of um, some of the 
sad stories that we had coming out of our detention centres, in particular under the Howard regime. Um, it was very clearly documented during that time the um, devastating mental health impacts of being in detention, um, often for many years at a time, with the High Court of Australia also noting that indefinite detention was not unconstitutional. Um, I think that certainly the, the events over the, the last day or so and, and continuing at the moment um, have once again highlighted uh, detention as, you know, Australia has a mandatory detention policy for people, who, any people who arrive in the country without a visa. And I think that we might have some discussion about that in due course, whether that is the policy that other countries also pursue. It also, I think, becomes something that the new immigration minister has to deal with in the broader context of the uh, discussions that we've been having about offshore processing, a regional framework for asylum, and, and brings attention to Australia's international obligations um, in relation to detention as well as more broadly. So we've talked a little bit about the Refugee Convention and what it requires, but we haven't talked yet about international human rights treaties and the obligations that Australia has signed up to under those, um, which include, um, at minimum, not subjecting anybody to inhuman or degrading treatment. And I think it's arguable that, um, and I'm not talking about the specific case of the Fijian man, um, but more broadly that the conditions in detention, while they certainly have improved, are perhaps not uh, the, the most humane way of treating people. My name is Ben, I'm a student, I'm a law student and international studies student at UNSW. And my question is directed to any of the academics not from Australia. I just wanted a foreign perspective. Is it something we said or? Uh... <laughs> just a foreign perspective on Australia's um, processing of this, of asylum seekers and the Australian system. How do, like, are there similar debates? I know immigration is often an important election issue in all of your countries, but does it get as much sort of political rhetoric as we would have had in Australia over the last few years that would like arguably be a turning, um, a turning issue of an election? Anyone would like to start on that? Uh, Guy, we might just go down the table. Yeah, I'd happily talk about that because it means I can mention the word Blair. <laughs> um, Blair, as, as many of you may know, got into bed with the Murdoch Press Group um, very early on, 1995. And there was this rather unpleasant trade-off between the policies of so-called New Labour uh, and the headlines in The Sun and the News of the World and even in The Times, um, papers that my grandmother, a formidable 19th century woman, would have called and did call the gutter press. Um, they couldn't use race. We've had race relations legislation on our books, statutory books, since 1970s, and race is no longer a card you can play, and so asylum was the card that was played. And Blair frequently came out with statements about reducing the numbers of asylum seekers by half, about deporting more asylum seekers than arrived. He never once talked about improving the protection of those at risk. And that was a vote-getter to some extent in certain constituencies. Uh, I'm afraid politicians, it seems, need refugees. Um, I think they'll probably be sad to see if the problem ever will resolved. Uh, it is, I mean, it varies from country to country. You'll have read, of course, recently about President Sarkozy's actions in relation to the Roma, not themselves refugees, but a migrant people in Europe with which Europe is going to have to learn how, how, to, how to accommodate itself. Um, there is always, it seems to the politician, political capital to be made out of, out of xenophobia, uh, out of uh, beating up on the other. Uh, it's not the case in every country. Canada, it's very rare indeed to find that sort of publicity. And I think in the United States too, that does not tend to be a factor. Uh, yes, that's correct. We would have, there's of course a large debate in my country about immigration and um, politicians can score points on the backs of immigrants, but the asylum debate is somewhat submerged, you know, fortunately for refugees uh, and refugee advocates. Uh, and I'm not exactly sure why that is, except the numbers are relatively small. Um, I wanted to say with respect to the offshore processing that um, 
I believe the United States pioneered it uh, with Guantanamo and some other creative activities in the Caribbean in the 1990s. Uh, and so to that extent, the damage, was, the damage has been done. Our Supreme Court has blessed the interdiction of boats um, and the turning back of asylum seekers without any inquiry whatsoever into whether or not they need protection. And that's, in a nutshell, the US policy now in the Caribbean. So, I guess what I'm saying is we don't have offshore processing because we don't process them at all. We just send them back. The problem within Europe is that we have confused immigration and asylum. Um, asylum is about offering protection. Immigration is about controlling your borders. And you will not so much see the asylum issue being used strongly, but you will see immigration. One of the biggest um, complaints in recent years uh, within the United Kingdom has been about all the people coming in, uh, migrant workers, from other parts of the European Union, which has got nothing to do with refugee status. But there's this confusion that the country is being, quotes, flooded. It's not. People seeking refugee status are meant to obtain protection as a consequence of a treaty obligation that the United Kingdom voluntarily <coughs> entered into. So I find it slightly disconcerting that allegedly intelligent people who are meant to be governing the country will confuse asylum seekers, migration within the European Union, which is meant to be um, regularised and legitimate, and other forms of migration, which can be controlled, but should be controlled in an appropriate manner. And it's this that causes the problem for refugees. You keep everything confused, and people are led to rely on, a, on xenophobia. I think that's the easiest way to describe it. Basically, xenophobia is a good thing for politicians to use because, let's face it, people who are not citizens of the country have no votes. So you can beat up on them and it doesn't cost you anything in the election. Tell us what you really think, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> now, Jane, you're not allowed to answer that question. Um, you're an Australian academic. But uh, I might ask Jane a question nonetheless myself. And we've talked a little bit about the, the role of human rights in this area. And uh, uh, the one case as a barrister that I've been involved in dealing with asylum seekers, a case called Plaintiff S157. We argued in the High Court around rights to judicial review. It raised a range of fundamental human rights questions. And in that case, we made the strategic decision as barristers not to mention the words human rights on any occasion because we felt that that would be a red rag to a bull and would actually gravely undermine our capacity to win the case. Um, it tells a bit of a story about uh, the difficulties of associating human rights law with some of these questions in our highest court and elsewhere. Jane, does it need to be that way? Why is it that we're so fixated on the Refugee Convention in Australia but we can't bring in the sort of human rights standards that would seem to be a necessary complement to actually providing for the, the proper and just disposal of these matters? Well, we got quite close to doing that about a year ago, um, but then the, the, the bill that was before Parliament, and I'll explain what I'm talking about in a second, um, mysteriously uh, went all quiet and we haven't heard anything about it for a year. What I'm referring to is um, the notion of complementary protection. That is, that under interna certain international human rights treaties, uh, such as the um, ICCPR, uh, International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the Convention Against Torture. Um, we actually have obligations not to return people to face torture or to um, face a situation where they could be arbitrarily deprived of life, in other words they might be killed, um, including where they might be subjected to the death penalty. And we're not permitted under international law to return people to a place where they fear cruel, inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment. Nonetheless, under Australian law as it stands, people cannot claim asylum under any of those grounds unless they can also show that those grounds constitute 
persecution for reason of that person's race, religion, nationality, political opinion, or membership of a particular social group. Now, Australia is, is standing um, alone in terms of industrialised countries on this issue. The European Union countries all provide protection on these grounds and um, another one as well. Canada uh, has protection available. New Zealand um, is in the process of implementing legislation that will enable people to claim um, for protection for those reasons. And the US um, refuses to return people who are at risk of torture. Um, the, the only mechanism in, in Australia is a discretionary one. So basically you have to go through the whole refugee process, even if you know at the outset that you're unable, for example, to show that you're going to be tortured because of your political opinion, as opposed to just being tortured. Um, so you still have to go through the process of applying for refugee status, then appealing the de decision that you're not a refugee. And when you have that negative appeal, um, you, for, from the refugee review, the, the decision from the refugee review tribunal, um, you can uh, seek for ministerial intervention, and this is a non-compellable, non-reviewable discretion that ought to be personally exercised by the minister for immigration. And so you can see that it's a, a bit of a lottery in terms of um, whether your claim is considered. And I understand they they are, but nonetheless, the law says it's up to the minister whether. He, a, he even chooses to look at your claim, um, B, what he chooses to decide, and C, um, no one can review it. Thanks, Shane. Look, it may just be me, but it sounds like we need a Bill of Rights, but we won't get into <laughs> I that area. you might say that, George. Um, you've talked there about one big difference between Australian law in this area and complementary protection as against other um, industrialised Western nations. I wonder whether the other panellists could give us a bit of a sense about some of the other aspects of Australian refugee law, just how distinctive are we? In, in particular, I wonder, apart from the United States, which uh, has already been mentioned, the extent to which offshore or regional processing is a feature now amongst other nations. And also, to what extent is it common to find, as we had in Australia, uh, children, including unaccompanied children, in lengthy periods of detention uh, before being properly processed? Um, Guy? I think it's important that we distinguish when we're talking about what happens offshore between the selection processes which take place under a resettlement program and the determination of whether someone is or is not a refugee. That brings in the issue of queue jumping, which I think it's important, upon which I think it's important to say something. Uh, a queue is not a solution. The way in which the queue jumper language is used seems to suggest that everyone who reaches the head of the queue finds a solution. They don't. They may be accepted or they may be rejected. And very often they will be rejected not because they're not refugees, but for some reason or another they do not fit the profile of the particular resettlement country in question, or indeed of any potential resettlement country. So what we are left with nonetheless as a result of the queue is a number, a very large number of refugees for whom there is no solution and for whom there is no end to the desperation. And that accounts for a lot of the so-called irregular movements of refugees beyond their first places in which they found a measure of security to some other place where they hope to restart their lives. Now that's something different from consigning people to a distant or remote place, another land, for the purpose of determining whether they're refugees or not, the so-called Pacific Solution, which used Nauru and uh, related places as a base upon which, from which to determine whether someone was or was not a refugee. Now, one point that's never really been thought through on this is what happens to the international obligations. Uh, when Australia sent, uh, in return for having paid very large amounts of money to certain individuals, or maybe perhaps even to the government of Nauru, when it sent large numbers of individuals to Nauru, it didn't cease to have international obligations. Now, Nauru, as many of you will know, is not party to the 51 Convention or the Basic Human Rights Treaties. But it became, through that operation, the agent of Australia, and Australia therefore retained the responsibility in law to ensure that Nauru abided by the obligations uh, for which uh, it had become responsible as a result of Australia's contract with it. That, I think, opens the door to the idea, to further consideration of the idea of offshore processing and to the idea of regional processing centres, which may have good points in them, but they have to be international, have to be regional in nature. <coughs> And that's why when I opened in my remarks, I was thinking very much of how the Indo-China situation was resolved, which was through the coming together of states with an interest in the issues, states which recognized 
that other states had interests or concerns which needed to be addressed, and that above all there were refugees who were in need of protection and solutions. Those are the governing criteria, it seems to me, which should be present in any discourse about regional processing centres, that we are seeing, we would then see a regime, a regional regime emerge which was essentially oriented to solutions, not simply to determining whether someone was or was not a refugee and thereafter leaving them in limbo. So that's one aspect of the equatorial dimension which I wanted to, to emphasise. Thank you. And Kate, I might, I might direct your attention to this question of uh, children in detention. You've talked about uh, offshore um, solutions in the United States. What has been the position with regard to the children in those type of facilities and has there been any different set of rules for dealing with them? Uh, well, let me just clarify. We don't have offshore processing now. There's a tiny, tiny number of asylum seekers uh, that are on Guantanamo at any given time. They're in a different part of the um, military base there. Uh, and we have no way of knowing if there's kids there or not. Um, but in terms of our detention facilities onshore in the United States, uh, children are detained. They're supposed to be detained, you know, with certain protective rules, uh, but they're by and large insufficient uh, to, in fact, protect them. So, I'm sorry, I forgot the question. But yeah, we do detain children, but I, I don't think it's in as um, bleak as circumstances as my understanding of Australian detention of children is. So. Jeff, I might actually direct your attention to a different aspect, to particularly mandatory detention. And uh, I wonder what extent, uh, given that Australia obviously has had that scheme for a long time, do we see that in other countries? Well, I, think. Right. I think you've got to start by uh, addressing what is meant by mandatory detention, because um, you now have within Australia this concept of community detention, which can mean that people are on um, Christmas Island, they're allowed to move around Christmas Island, but basically they don't go off Christmas Island. So to what extent is community detention not just sort of mandatory detention, it's just mandatory detention with a bit more space. And we've, we see that in other countries as well. Australia is not unique in using detention, um, but Australia is a country where I would not expect there to be this degree of detention. The other country which I can think of which uses detention in possibly even greater extent is Malta. Okay? But Malta is a very small island. Okay? And it has a system whereby if you go to Malta you are automatically detained for um, 12 months in the first instance. But, that, but there's an exception for those who are vulnerable. So children should not be detained even under that system. Okay? And if you think of Malta, Malta's on a direct migration route out of Africa. So it's got a much larger problem to deal with in terms of people moving through it. What surprises me about Australia as an outsider is just how much detention is used, considering the size of the country, the resources the country has available to it and just why it thinks that detention is a, an appropriate means of dealing with people who are seeking protection. Canada has many more people coming to it, and yet it doesn't feel the need to use detention. And so what is the, the alternative that you'd be suggesting that we might use more of? I would suggest that you don't need to detain people in order to process them. There's absolutely no... Um, benefit to be gained by keeping people locked up or just restricted in their movement while their decision while the decision is being taken on them. The refugee status determination is not a quick process, especially not if it's being done properly. And to detain people for long periods of time whilst you're waiting for government officials and then courts to make a decision about your status for some durable solution there is no reason on earth in a country that has the resources that's available to Australia to keep them detained. I'll ask one more question before opening it up to the audience again. We've talked about what are often portrayed as some of the, the negative, uh, the less savoury aspects of Australia's asylum policy, but 
given that we've spent 20 years debating this and erecting a, a very elaborate apparatus, I, I wonder from an international perspective whether there are some positive things, whether there are some things there that we have or can usefully teach the international community about the way we process asylum seekers. Is there any good to this story from your perspective? Okay. <laughs> Fools rush in, yes. Um, you know, I think one definite mark in Australia's favor is the extensive amount of resettlement that it has done. And resettlement, as Professor Goodwin Gill was mentioning earlier, um, is a voluntary program where states go assist other asylum countries by bringing in some refugees. So the refugees already left their country of origin, they're in a refugee camp somewhere. And the US and Canada and Australia and a few other countries will go in and help share the burden um, and allow those people to enter as refugees. And Australia, I believe, has is, is resettled 700,000 people since the end of the Second World War. And I think that's um, very admirable. And that's certainly a, a plus uh, in Australia's column. Yeah. Well, I can only in, in, endorse that. And as I mentioned um, earlier, as, as uh, Professor Jasson has reminded me, the, you know, the commitment to the Indochina refugee crisis um, was remarkable. It, the, the level of public support and political support was incredible. And I think that's something which we need to recall. And I think you also mentioned, didn't you, the jurisprudence that has helped to develop sensitivity amongst decision makers elsewhere to the gender dimensions of the refugee, the potential gender dimensions of the refugee uh, <laughs> definition. And I think it, it's important to mention how often and how frequently Canadian case law is cited in other common law jurisdictions, in particular in, well, of course, in, in, uh, in the United Kingdom, in, in Canada, and in New Zealand, and in a positive way. Uh, and it has, even within the constraints which exist under the Migration Act, it's not certainly the most free-flowing liberal interpretation of the Refugee, of the refugee Convention. Nonetheless, uh, decision makers have helped to advance on uh, the, the meaning of the, of the refugee definition and therefore the protection to be accorded under the refugee definition. It hasn't always been like that. There are exceptions to it, but it has made a very positive contribution. Thank you. I can't really add much to what's been said. I mean, the, the, the Comprehensive Plan of Action when Australia played a full role in trying to provide a regional solution is possibly the high point in Australia's dealing with the, the number of refugees it has settled, it has resettled. If you think about Australia, though, post-1945, it has been a country that has accepted large numbers of people from various countries fleeing persecution. You think of the numbers who were accepted after the Hungarian uprising of 1956. So there is this sense in which Australia has opened its doors, has welcomed people in when they're fleeing persecution, not just sort of at the time of Indochina, but over a long period, not necessarily to do with refugee status, sort of as one would normally understand it, but this is a country that has um, welcomed many people who at that time needed protection. And it would be, I don't think, I think it would be good for the country to look back on that and say, well, that didn't harm us, why are we worried now? And look, Jane, I might phrase the question slightly differently to you as someone who's immersed in a Australian refugee law. Are there areas that we are on the cutting edge in terms of protection that, in fact, from your experience in looking at our legal system, that, uh, in fact, we do have something in that area to offer the international community? Well, <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, I, I think as Guy was saying, Australian jur jurisprudence has um, being very informative in the, in the international context, now perhaps not always in the way that I might think it ought to be. But we do have very uh, lengthy reasoned decisions that um, perhaps interestingly do from time to time refer to international law, to UNHCR guidelines, to notes on international protection, to the, the kind of broader soft law framework. Um, and uh, I think some of the dissents, for example, from Justice Kirby in particular have you know, okay, they, they didn't um, change, they, didn't, they weren't instrumental in, in changing the law or making the law, but nonetheless um, are very insightful into how international law needs to inform the domestic context and that we cannot seriously think that we can operate unilaterally on this issue. The refugee phenomenon is a global phenomenon that has always existed. Australia, no matter what it does, is never going to solve um, what it perceives to be the problem of refugees. And if I could just 
briefly speak to the resettlement um, issue, Australia is um, third in the world in terms of resettlement. Um, in 2008, the US resettled around 60,000 refugees, Canada around 11,000, and Australia close to 9,000. So, I mean, on a per capita basis, um, we are doing pretty well. But it's a quirk of the Australian system that we have created the good refugees who we pick and choose from camps and invite into our country, and these so-called you know, bad queue jumper refugees who, um, for a number of you know, legitimate or understandable reasons, um, get here under their own steam. Thanks, Jane. It's always good to get, uh, see the sense of justice, the sense of justice Kirby getting a run. So, uh, now questions from the audience. Uh, yes, we've got a question just here. We'll take a few on this occasion. Um, question I'd like to ask is, um, what do the panel think about the criminalisation of activities designed to assist people to um, claim rights under the Refugee Convention? And, Australia, of course, these people are called people smugglers, which is a pejorative term, but uh, many other terms can be used to describe them, and they're simply providing services to people to enable them or to facilitate them in um, claiming their rights under the Convention. Yet uh, those activities have become more and more heavily criminalised in Australia, and. Um, with, with mandatory detention and uh, mandatory sentences and so forth. I'd like some response on that. Thank you. Um, you know, smuggling and trafficking is in fact on the rise, um, largely because legal migration options are increasingly shut off. It's kind of an arms race between smugglers and traffickers on the one side and states on the other side. And it seems to me a, a really unfortunate example of um, policies that might seem like they are a good idea in the short term, although I would question that, but they certainly don't work in the long term. Um, people are not deterred, smuggling, you know, the process of getting smuggled or trafficked becomes more expensive, more dangerous, more people die, uh, etc. So, and this affects both forced migrants and, and, and other migrants as well. So, uh, the criminalizing various elements of transnational movement um, doesn't seem to me to be a very short or certainly long-term effective way to deal with the, the issue. Thank you. Um, my name is Zaina. I'm from the Law Faculty in New South Wales, Uni of New South Wales. I just wanted to ask about the Indochina issue that you raised and wondering whether or not post 9-11 um, there has been a greater element of racism brought into the debate in relation to asylum seekers. Um, as opposed to the Indochina model, whereby there was far more participation by Australia? Well, my perception is, in any event, that there, that there is a, a latent xenophobia, I think, that's connected uh, to the asylum issue generally. Um, and, and we have seen linkages being made by senior politicians between um, for example, with the Tampa, suggestions that perhaps the asylum seekers on the Tampa were terrorists themselves, therefore why would we be assisting these people? Um, I, I mean, I haven't done any empirical studies to actually determine you know, whether that is the case, but I, I think that people do make those connections. Um, I, I don't think we saw as much of it in the, in the recent election campaign, but there we saw asylum being linked into uh, migration and population. So um, we were talking about asylum seekers in the same breath as we were talking about the numbers of migrants coming to Australia, um, and then as the, uh, talking about how um, somehow we, our population was getting too large and it was the, the, the asylum seekers and refugees that were at fault. Uh, Dennis O'Brien, I had the uh, Refugee Review Tribunal. Um, I just wanted to uh, just make a point of, uh, I think, of clarification, uh, really, in relation to uh, uh, comment that uh, that Jeff Gilbert had made. Um, the, the RRT deals with about uh, 2,500 decisions a year on appeal from the uh, Department of, uh, of Immigration, uh, and. Uh, just thinking of the uh, of uh, detention. In fact, uh, there's only about two or three percent, I think, uh, of our applicants uh, who are in detention uh, when we deal with them. So, um, 
I just thought it was worth to, uh, to, to make that point of clarification. Thank you. But you do have the highest number of people in detention now than you have had for a very long time. Yes, that's, that's true. Uh, I, 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 you know, what we've got into now in Australia is a sort of a two-stream a two approach for dealing with, uh, uh, with uh, people who seek uh, refugee protection. And uh, the, the group of people who are quaintly now called irregular maritime arrivals, yes, uh, they, they are in, uh, many of those are in detention. Uh, and, uh, of course, that is a caseload that we, um, for better or for worse, uh, do not deal with. Uh, yeah, my name is Paul Power and I'm from the Refugee Council of Australia. Um, I'm just interested to um, get the different panellists' thoughts, including Guy Goodwin-Gill's thoughts, um, about the concept that the Prime Minister spoke of in uh, July of a regional refugee protection framework as opposed to a regional <coughs> processing centre. Now, given Australia's place um, you know, to the north of you know, the countries of South and Southeast Asia, so many of them not... Um, uh, convention uh, signatory countries um, and the attitudes of um, countries in Southeast Asia such as Thailand, Malaysia and Indonesia. Um, I'm just interested to think in your thoughts about how Australia and also with Australia's own uh, patchy record in um, being rather uh, single-minded in shifting its, um, uh, deflecting its responsibilities to other countries. Um, how might you think Australia could um, progress uh, debate and, and discussion on a regional protection framework. Um, yeah, how, how does it actually uh, gather the um, get the attention of its neighbours in Southeast Asia? How does it also um, bring other resettlement countries um, into the discussion? Also, given the great need for resettlement around the world. You've got a couple of hours, have you? <laughs> I think yes or no will do. No. <laughs> I think this is a, a very exciting notion, actually, that we've got here at issue, a potential issue. I think Australia has the experience, but as you're right, it has a patchy record, and therefore it lacks a certain measure of credibility. Um, that patchiness actually goes back even to the time of the Indochina refugee crisis, when Australia developed an initiative on what was then called temporary refuge, because it anticipated that were it to be faced with a massive influx of refugees from uh, Southeast Asia, the rest of the world would turn around and say, well, you seem to have quite a lot of space. Um, why don't you get on with it and look after them? Um, and so it developed the idea of temporary refuge with a view, in fact, to promoting more solidarity amongst nations, drawing on what was then the Indochina experience with a view to finding solutions which were spread as widely as possible. Uh, I think if I, if, I were, if I were the Prime Minister or the Foreign Minister, um, I would be trying to bring in the nations of Southeast Asia with a view to having a new look at what the problems are in the region in relation not only to asylum seeking uh, so-called irregular movements, which so often are not uh, really irregular, they are continuing continuations in search of refuge, uh, to identify the nature of the issues there, rescue at sea once again, for example, interception and so on, uh, to look at the, 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 who it was who was moving around the region who needed refuge and bring in the countries which are uh, involved with a view to developing something like a comprehensive plan of action in which protection would be the paramount consideration. It has to be. Uh, because if protection is not the issue, then those in need of protection will simply find ways to avoid whatever mechanisms are put in their place. But I think there is a moment here which, which Australia could take. Um, it has the resources, it does have the experience, uh, it does have the interest, but it can't do it unilaterally. And this has already been said, but already tonight. Um, there are no unilateral solutions to the issue of refugee movements. And that was recognised way back in the day when they formulated the 51 Convention, when they set up the International Refugee Organisation. In February 1946, when the General Assembly accept, adopted its first resolution on refugees, it recognised that the, inter the refugee issue is international and that no single state should be required or expected to bear the burden or the responsibility alone. So I think here's an opportunity for Australia to reach out to other countries in the region, with UNHCR, of course, um, indeed with other human rights organisations, because the issues are likely to go beyond perhaps some of those immediately concerning UNHCR, and to see whether we can't work out 
uh, for this region, perhaps as a model also for other regions, some sort of mechanism for ensuring that those in need of protection and solutions do find it, as we uh, have done in the past. We have provided solutions and protection in the past, and there's no reason why we shouldn't be able to do today, even in the changed world, in which perhaps uh, we are no longer so inclined to disregard refugee status for uh, bigger or so-called bigger political reasons. Uh, I think there's an opportunity here that needs to be taken up. Thank you. Okay. Yes, I would just add to that that premised, of course, on protection and, and undertaken by means of a serious diplomatic effort. And by that I mean actually taking the interests of the other countries into consideration and doing some trading back and forth. I saw the negative example of that uh, carried out by the U.S. and the Caribbean in the 1990s when in the midst of the refugee crisis, and I'm putting that word in quotes because the numbers were not that large, uh, the U.S. spent an enormous amount of time and energy and money running around to different countries in the Caribbean, trying to get them to take some of these Haitians and Cubans and, you know, basically getting very, very little cooperation uh, because the states, the, the, the states in the Caribbean knew that uh, the U.S. was desperate, uh, that they weren't really serious about this, it was just going to be a cosmetic thing, and it wasn't going to be anything lasting that would inure to the benefit of these, these island nations. So. To whatever extent Australia wants to take on a serious regional initiative, you know, obviously it has to take its neighbors seriously as well. I think it goes beyond the Refugee Convention. I think what you're looking at here is to a certain extent root causes, and root causes means that you're getting into or rather root conditions rather than root causes, root conditions for migration. And at that point you should really be looking at sort of broader concepts um, in international human rights law. How do you protect people in their own country so that they don't, in the, to start off with, feel the need to move and seek protection elsewhere? And that can be both in terms of civil and political rights, but also economic, social and cultural rights too, that Australia can engage with its neighbours in terms of ensuring that conditions in those countries don't make people feel that they have to move to Australia or other richer nations in the region in order to survive. And one can look at the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights and see there that there is an international obligation um, on states' parties to cooperate with other states in order to enhance economic, social and cultural rights on a more global basis. So I think it's not just refugee protection here, it's human rights protection as well. Yes, and I think clearly um, money is not the issue when we consider that Australia spent a billion dollars um, we, uh, on um, around 1,500 asylum seekers who they held offshore on Nauru and Manus Island. So I think we can see how a billion dollars might be better spent, um, both in terms of providing humanitarian assistance um, to other countries to, well, not just humanitarian assistance, but technical assistance and cooperation um, to start to address some of the root causes um, in countries of origin, as well as to our uh, partners in the region, and actually to treat countries in the region as partners, not as Australia in some um, quasi-colonial sort of role, uh, being the, the big brother when it wishes to and, and being notably absent when it doesn't suit it. Other questions? Yes, we've got a question down the front here. Hi, I'm Simon. Um, I'm kind of from the great unwashed, uh, nowhere in particular. Um, I just noticed when we were talking about how Australia's uh, positive aspects of our asylum and immigration, there was a very big change in body language. Um, obviously, with jurisprudence that was mentioned before, Australia used to be an up-and-comer and was viewed favourably in asylum taking and protection. When did we change and what do you feel has, has caused these movements. Obviously, we've come a long way and are not viewed in that way now. What are those causes that have made us slip? Um, and I've, I mean, my experience in Australia led me to hold Australia very close to my heart for many years. I was very concerned to see what happened after I left, after my five years here, which were very, 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 very good years, 78 to 83. <laughs> 
And what happened in that period was a very large number of Indo-Chinese were resettled, and it was, as I said, was a very positive period. But something happened in the 80s. Um, there was a reaction, and I think there was a popular reaction. I don't mean a popular popular reaction, but a reaction in certain segments of the population against the, the, the consequences what had followed from that period of uh, Vietnamese Indo-Chinese resettlement. Uh, you know, when the kids, the Vietnamese kids, the Cambodian kids started taking prizes in the inner city suburbs, people began to realize what had happened to their country. It was very shortly after, of course, the uh, end of the white Australia policy that Malcolm Fraser and, and, and Michael McKellar took Australia into the resettlement of non-European refugees. And it didn't do it with a mandate, not an express mandate through election. Uh, it did it with a measure of popular support because of the media attention to the crisis at the time. But there was a reaction in the 1980s against the change in the nature of the country. And I think that was also exacerbated, I, it's not a word that I would use, I don't think it was exacerbated, it was exacerbated in the minds of politicians by the fact that the number of boats continued to come in, in particular from Cambodia towards the end of the 1980s. And suddenly that was an issue that could be used to political advantage, given the apparent unhappiness of certain sections of the population, certain areas of, of cities, much as we have in the UK and elsewhere, at the change in the neighborhood which had necessarily taken place through this movement. And unfortunately, it seems to me that change has never really got back. The, the balance has never quite been restored. Uh, I think I would like to think it's in the process of being restored. In the meantime, institutional changes have happened, which have to some extent helped, to some extent hindered uh, the protection of rights. Um, and policies have been tried and found wanting, such as that of mandatory detention. Um, you know, investigations by government did reveal the very serious damage done to men, women, and children through prolonged detention. And, and that was a reason for thinking again about that process. Uh, I would like to think that we're on, uh, on the cusp of a new era of positive thinking towards refugees and towards protection. Um, that perhaps we have in this country, I use the word we advisedly again because this is a country which I do follow very closely, that we have perhaps been, found ourselves, we do now find ourselves in a position where we can move on and recognizing that we are now a much broader constituency than we once were, uh, but still have those resources of hospitality uh, within us and respect for the rule of law and the dignity of others that would allow us to, to move forward into a, a protection era for refugees. Guy, just a quick follow-up question. You've talked about things that are specific to Australia in explaining a shift, but to what extent has that shift been a shift among a number of democratic Western nations? And given if that is the case, are there other factors outside of Australia that are equally explaining a bit of a worldwide change in this area about attitudes and perceptions? I don't think there's been a worldwide change at all. I think there, is, there are changes in particular countries. I mean, I don't think the United Kingdom was ever in, in recent years particularly receptive towards refugees and asylum seekers because they, as already been mentioned by Jeff, were unable for many years to, to separate out the refugee from the migrant. Uh, each individual, whether migrant or refugee, was another foreign number added to the population. And that uh, was something which left politicians with room for maneuver in, in the, uh, the vote-gathering business. But in other countries, there's been concern about management. I mean, states, governments are notoriously inefficient when it comes to determining refugee status. You'd think with 50, 60 years of experience, they'd have learned how to do it well. But there's a great deal of reluctance to do what in Canada, and I lived there for five years too, when they shortly after they set up their Immigration and Refugee Board, what we call front-end loading the ideal of getting decision-making right as soon as possible from the start, so that appeals, although they would be there, wouldn't really be necessary. For some reason, governments don't want to do that. They also find, of course, a particular challenge in the fact that numbers change. You can't predict with certainty how many asylum seekers you will have next year. To that extent, you are dependent upon what happens in the rest of the world, whether there is a new crisis, new wars, new genocides, new instances of massive violations of human rights. You've got, in effect, to, be, to have in place a flexible system. UNHCR has much the same problem. Uh, how many will there be next year? We don't know. So that's a challenge which governments have not actually been prepared to accept. And that, I think, gets mixed into the pot as well and helps perhaps to fuel that concern that uh, politicians and sections of the population and media like to develop about losing control of borders, which is, I think, in many respects, a load of, a load of nonsense. Um, there never will be control of borders, not in a finite and absolute sense. Uh, and if you think about it, why would there be if we were in a refugee situation, desperate, 
uh, we would find that we had the resources and the imagination greater than that of the bureaucrat or the politician and sufficient to get us to a place of safety. And that is something that I think governments and states have to realize, this the inevitability of there being migration and learning how to deal with it, the inevitability of there being in this modern world, refugee flows, and thinking about how best to respond to those needs. Hi, I'm Nicole. I'm a former UNSW student and now a solicitor. Just wondering, in Australia, there's this strange thing where we try to avoid the burden, but at the same time, when push comes to shove, we acknowledge our international law obligations to protect refugees. And there have been a few instances where the Howard government had to publicly acknowledge that. So, I mean, is that kind of weird thinking happening in Europe and the UK, for instance? Weird thinking? I'm not saying it's weird thinking. Um, as an academic, it's weird thinking. But if I was a, if I was a politician, um, I would I would be there saying, right, well, what do I want to achieve? I want to make uh, the people who vote for me feel secure. How can I make the people who vote for me feel secure? I know I'll pretend that I'm actually in control of the country I'm governing. Uh, and that includes pretending that I can actually control the borders, um, which you can't. Um, and the United Kingdom's borders are a lot smaller than Australia's borders. And we can't control the United Kingdom's well. You're never going to be able to control Australia's borders effectively. If I c but if I'm a politician and I can hopefully make you believe that I can control it, then you'll feel safe and secure. Politicians do this all the time. They, they, they can't succeed. What would be better um, is spending this money on producing um, an orderly process so that people who come here and seek protection know that they're going to get fair access to a fair determination procedure because that would um, immediately give rise to a proper process in terms of if you're accepted, the country you're allowed in. If you're not accepted, there wouldn't be a need for an appeal as much as there is now. People would be then within the country accepting that those who are admitted and those who arrive are actually going to be welcomed, in, welcomed as opposed to the system at present whereby everybody's got to be kept out because there's so many coming and it's a fear factor. Um, I would strongly advocate for a better determination procedure which does unfortunately require resources. It's not quite as catchy, though, as we will stop the boats, is it? <laughs> and that, of course, is the problem. But we've, we've got a few minutes left before this part of the session finishes, and we've got uh, uh, two quick questions, one here and one here. And uh, what we might do is take both of the questions, and then we'll have our panel answer them uh, collectively. Hi, my name's Sarah Lux uh, with the University of New South Wales. I was just wondering, with this fear factor um, that Professor Gilbert just mentioned, and it's been touched upon by all of the speakers, uh, the feeling that refugee issues are connected with population issues or the feeling that refugee issues are connected with terrorist issues. I was wondering whether any of the speakers had any thoughts on an advocacy level of how one might go about uh, addressing or abating or in any way contributing to, to the reduction of this popular fear that's been drummed up by the media and um, by the political system, uh, whether, whether you had any thoughts on that. Thank you. And we'll, we'll take the other question uh, just here as well. Thank you. My name is Frances Milne. I've been involved with the refugees uh, for the last 35 years, first as the uh, Executive Officer of the Federation of Ethnic Communities Councils around the time we were welcoming and setting up special uh, settlement programs for refugees from Indochina. I'm now uh, coordinating a, a group which uh, has volunteers coming in to assist failed asylum seekers after they have been rejected by the Refugee Review Tribunal and trying to then 
for people that we believe are truly in danger of being deported, when they're deported of being tortured or imprisoned or even executed, uh, try to turn back that, uh, that decision. The question I've got is, some of you may be familiar with uh, the adversarial system. Uh, we have an inquisitorial system here where virtually the decision of one decision maker in the tribunal cannot be challenged in our courts, especially when it comes down to credibility issues and the number of people being rejected is of great concern to us. In the past, we've been able to overturn it by getting additional evidence. It's becoming harder and harder. The minister rarely intervenes. And so the question really is, are we better off with an adversarial system where it is a court-like situation or the inquisitorial system where one person is able to make a very, very important decision. Well, thank you both for the questions. I might address the, the first one on, on um, advocacy. How, you know, what can people in the community do? What can NGOs do to try and address this fear factor? It's, I mean, I think it's it's not easy, and perhaps it's something that um, will take a number of years to try and. Um, turn around the perceptions that are in the broader community. I mean, I think sometimes um, I'm listening to the wrong media when I think, oh, everyone's finally got it. And then you turn on talk back radio that's not the ABC or pick up the <laughs> Daily Telegraph and realise, no, they haven't. Um, something that's very important is leadership. And this is where I say maybe it's difficult for um, people in the broader community to, to um, pick up on this, because I think political leadership is, is very important. But I do think that grassroots organisations can be extremely powerful, as we saw um, in the latter years of, of Howard, and we saw the number of a large number of refugee support groups spring up that I think really did start to address um, the people's perceptions of refugees and asylum seekers. And, and so I think when people actually encounter asylum seekers on a personal level um, and have the opportunity to hear about what their stories are, what they've fled, why they've come here and why they've come here in the manner that they have, there is a humanity that kind of kicks in and an understanding. And so I think um, events and opportunities that allow that are very important. Yeah. Um, again, I'm going to stick on the um, advocacy one as opposed to the process. Um, and I think one thing would be just to get accurate figures across to the population as to how many people actually seek refugee status here. Um, in 2009, there were 6,200 approximately applications for refugee status in Australia. There were 29,800 in the United Kingdom. Um, if you take a look at the 44 industrialised countries of the world, there were 377,000. Australia, 6,200 is a very small number of applications also needs to be measured against Pakistan, which in 2009 was housing 1,700,000 refugees. That's one million more than Australia's taken in the past 60 years. I actually had a couple of thoughts on each of those questions. Um, I would certainly second what Jane and Jeff had said about addressing the fear factor. Um, yeah, it takes leadership um, at all levels of the society, moral and political leadership. Uh, I certainly agree that personal encounters, and I don't probably need to tell this group, but when people have personal encounters with refugees, it can help them see them as actual people. Um, I would think that the advantage here in a sort of perverse way is that your system is so egregiously bad, particularly your detention system, that all you really have to do is publicize it. I would think that at least some segment of the community has to be so ashamed at what goes on um, in, your, in your detention centers that that plus also using the international sort of mechanisms, mechanisms to try to beat up on the government and these policies would be all good and helpful. Um, and I'm not presuming to tell Australian NGOs what to do because I, I am in awe of them because I know how hard you guys fight. As far as the inquisitorial system versus an adversarial, um, that's an interesting question. Actually, in the US, we have a bit of a hybrid depending kind of what stream the person enters. Um, asylum adjudications through. And lately I've been thinking that adversarial is better because, um, oh no, sorry, other way around. I'm, I'm really tired of the adversarial and I've been thinking that the inquisitorial is better to just have the one person. But 
I think it really depends on, um, I think it really depends on the availability of counsel and the quality of counsel, and I don't know enough about Australia to comment, comment on that part of it, but certainly in my context, um, you know, it's really having legal representation that is high quality is really the only thing that works. I was excited for a moment because I thought I was going to be able to disagree with Kate, but then she <laughs> corrected herself. Um, I've had experience of the system in Canada, which is also a bit of a hybrid, and I must say from having been, as it were, in, uh, there and seen it working, uh, I'm afraid that is the system that tends to work best at that particular stage of initial decision making, where the task of the decision maker or decision makers is with all due help from whomever may be uh, the identifiable person claimants, uh, uh, advocate, or uh, as in Canada, a refugee hearings officer, to elucidate, to elucidate the story and to try to understand uh, the individual uh, in social and political context, what it was that made uh, led him or her to flee. And I think in my experience it is the inquisitorial uh, approach and that sort of culture which tends to bring the stories out, and they are, uh, and they are always stories. Which is not to say there isn't a role for the adversarial system as well, and I think when you move beyond that initial decision-making level to questions of interpretation and the meaning of law, then the adversarial system can very often come into its own uh, and be very, uh, very effective. Um, I just wanted to add my voice to those who have who, called for leadership too, uh, in changing attitudes. It's so difficult to undo uh, what has been done, the damage that has been done. Uh, part of that process will necessarily involve, I think, more information, not only about numbers, as Jeff has shown us, uh, but about the international aspects of refugee protection. Uh, to know that there is a community out there which, like Australia in principle, supports the international rule of law and the ideals of protection and asylum, and which is ready, okay, with some pushing here and pulling there, uh, to play uh, a cooperative and partnership role uh, on these issues. Um, the adversarial side comes back into a, it's a small anecdote that I wanted to mention. There was a, what I would call a notorious Secretary of State for Home Affairs in the United Kingdom called David Blunkett, who was not at all known for his love of asylum seekers. But he did recognize that it was very important to isolate asylum seekers, lest they establish links with the community and become recognized as human beings. He knew that if that happened, then it would be very difficult, it became very difficult to remove people who were shown and understood by their neighbors to be good people, more often than not, to be people who did need uh, protection. Now, that was an initiative which was defeated. And it was defeated by way of planning law. Because when he came to put his, his ideas, his plans for the development of reception centers uh, before planning authorities in various parts of the countries, they, seeing what was entailed, uh, rejected them, and that policy came to an end. So you've got to think the, there are opportunities out there, and sometimes some of them are in the strangest of places. So what I'd like to ask you to do is, is really to thank our whole panel of four speakers for a really stimulating, interesting Q&A.